Hello everyone, uh, this is Seth Mayo uh, for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS, uh, currently floating over the Earth with you right now uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. This month is the 30th anniversary of the launch of this wonderful observatory, this telescope that was put into orbit above Earth's atmosphere to study the wonders of the universe from the solar system to the deepest parts of our observable universe. Uh, and it has done a tremendous amount of, of observations. Scientists and astronomers from around the world have done so much. So it's worth, um, it's worth celebrating this amazing piece of technology that uh, has helped the entire world and for many years to come. And it's given us some gorgeous pictures of our universe that many of you have probably seen before. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of take you on a quick tour through the universe, sort of highlighting some great achievements made by Hubble. And I'm, what I'm gonna do is kind of follow along with the article that I wrote in the latest issue of our uh, Arts and Sciences magazine. I wrote about Hubble uh, in, and some of the achievements that uh, it has accomplished, uh, or at least uh, accom accomplishments made by using the Hubble Space Telescope, because it's a great tool for unlocking the mysteries of the universe. So just a quick kind of intro, uh, as you may know, Hubble is an orbiting telescope above the Earth. There's a nice three-dimensional view of our planet, and this is a program uh, called Uniview that we actually use in our planetarium. Usually it's a full dome a circular dome shape on the ceiling that you look up towards. But fortunately, we can um, uh, use it in flat screen mode, as we like to say, and fly around like a spaceship that uh, all of you can sort of uh, take a, a ride along with me as we explore. So you see this orbit? I have my mouse here where you can see it uh, around the Earth. That is the uh, approximate orbit of Hubble. It sits over 350 miles above the uh, Earth's surface and Hubble was actually launched by the space shuttle in 1990 April 24 1990 that's kind of the, the anniversary celebrating this is a three-dimensional 3d model of the space shuttle this one's actually Atlantis um, for those who uh, remember or just know uh, and know a bit about Hubble Hubble was actually launched on space shuttle discovery uh, that now sits at the, at the Air and Space Museum in D.C. Um, but this is close enough. And so the Hubble Space Telescope was placed in the cargo bay uh, of uh, the space shuttle, launched in 1990, put into orbit. It's the size of a school bus. And so we can uh, take a look at uh, that Hubble Space Telescope. We'll just jump right to it to give you an idea. Uh, I'll just give you just some background on it. Uh, again, uh, bus school bus sized. Uh, and it's a reflector telescope. So it has a mirror uh, near the bottom here, uh, a parabolic mirror. And so light enters this way. This was a, a cover that it, they can put over the top. Light enters here, hits this mirror, and then uh, hits a series of instruments, depending on uh, what's being studied or looked at, or the wavelength of light. Because Hubble can see not just invisible light that we can see with our eyes, but can see an infrared light. Uh, which is a redder version of light, and then more bluer light, something called ultraviolet or more violet light, I guess you could say, uh, in, in the spectrum of light. So it can see in uh, more than our eyes can see, and that's what's so great about this. And it's placed above Earth's atmosphere to get a, away from the light distorting effect of that layer of air above us, giving it uh, an undisturbed view of the universe and has solar panels, gyroscopes to orient it, the point it in very precise ways, multiple cameras and in instruments uh, to uh, to study very different things. And it has studied so many different things from the solar system and beyond, like I mentioned earlier. And I'll give you actually uh, a better picture of Hubble that I can sort of uh, put up for you. This is a, a picture. Uh, of the space telescope and you can see kind of the reflective foil on the outside of it here um, but uh, that gives you kind of a better sense of it now right when it was launched real quick just some a little more history here uh, it was put into space and right when some of the what's called first light and that's the, when you open the telescope for the first time uh, they the astronomers noticed some really kind of terrible thing and the images 
this is one image of a star, were blurry and fuzzy. They weren't pinpoint. That was a big deal. What was figured out was the primary mirror, uh, the 7.8 foot mirror, the light gathering mirror, had a, a grounding error. It was incorrectly ground years pre uh, previous to launch and by a tiny amount. And that tiny amount uh, introduces a light error into it. So it's called aberration. And it caused this sort of uh, blurriness. And that's not good, right? Uh, so NASA had to scramble. It's kind of a big deal. And it took a few years to finally launch a servicing mission. It's called Servicing Mission 1. This is a picture from uh, the space shuttle visiting Hubble, attaching to it. And there's a couple astronauts doing cool things in space here. There's one of the uh, Canada arms that the astronaut is attached to. And uh, they had to basically add prescription lenses, if you just want to put it really simply, on Hubble to fix the aberration of the incorrect ground mirror. And so they fixed it. And it was successful. And so these servicing missions were crucial to the longevity of Hubble. There were four more. So five servicing missions in total to extend the life to, uh, of the of the space telescope to uh, improve it. They got better over time with improved cameras and optics and things like that. Uh, and just restoring other uh, vital electronics and, and things, uh, gyroscopes inside. So um, these servicing missions were great. And that was when the space shuttle was still flying. So the last servicing mission was in 2009. Um, and so that was very fortunate uh, to, uh, to have that. Anyway, so let's get started on some of the things that I explored in my article and some of the great things that Hubble has done. So we'll stick to our solar system first. And so what we'll do is just, we'll just zoom away from Hubble and the rest of the planet Earth here, and uh, we'll fly away. There's the orbit of the moon and get a, give ourselves a view of our entire solar system. And we'll kind of zoom out as you take a ride with me here. We're moving pretty quickly here. Uh, and so I think we're still looking at the inner solar system. So we want to look at the outer solar system. So after that servicing mission that fixed the fatal flaw or what could have been fatal for Hubble, um, there was, a, uh, there was um, but, you know, there needed to be some type of exciting observation. And that happened not long after the, the, the servicing mission. In 1994, Hubble was aimed towards Jupiter, you know, that big gas planet in our solar system, the biggest king of planets that we have in our neighborhood of planets. Um, so it just so happened that Jupiter uh, had a comet hitting it called Shoemaker-Levy 9. It's uh, named after some of the uh, astronomers that uh, discovered it, actually. And this comet was uh, had broken up years pr uh, prior to the impact. It, it actually got captured by the orbit or the gravity of Jupiter broke apart because uh, it got close to Jupiter and then fell in and Hubble was able to capture the impacts of it. So these blotches here are the impacts of these icy rocky debris. Some of them were up to 1.2 miles in diameter in length. Um, they left these huge blotches. First time ever we had a chance to see uh, an impact happen in the solar system almost pretty much live and uh, it up upturned uh, some of the gaseous um, molecules from underneath uh, the cloud layers here upwards so we could see kind of the deeper layers churned upwards. Now, of course, Jupiter is a gas planet filled with these gases, and, uh, and so we don't really have a good view of underneath the clouds. So the comet helped us to understand that, which was uh, extraordinary. And Hubble has also focused in on this feature here. We may, many of you may know, that's the Great Red Spot, the biggest storm uh, in the solar system. The Great Red Spot is the size of two or three Earths. And I'll show you a picture, uh, or actually a series of pictures. So this is a wonderful picture from Hubble of Jupiter, amazing shot of this planet. And this was in 2014 here. Um, and so uh, if you look here, what has been studied over time, 1995 is a picture here. This is a, one of the planetary cameras on Hubble. Uh, looking at the Great Red Spot, this giant storm, and what's been noticed this is in 2009 that the sh storm has been shrinking, and we're still not totally sure why, and there's still debate if it's actually going to disappear or if it's just going through a phase right now. Um, there's still some debate about that, but it has been shrinking, at least this 
uh, this view of this kind of red eye here of the storm. And that's been interesting. So Hubble has really given us a good glimpse of that over time and studied the auroras of Jupiter and not just Jupiter, but all the other outer planets in the solar system, Mars, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So it's done a lot to help us understand these planets, including that little object that used to be called a regular planet not too long ago. For those who remember, it was a planet uh, back, it was still a planet back in 2005, 2006. And that, of course, is the planet, or, or now the dwarf planet, Pluto. So if I zoom out far enough away, we're getting out to billions of miles away here. So inner solar system, outer solar system, and then this blue orbit is Pluto. And so Pluto has always been a very challenging thing to observe. It's tiny, smaller than our moon, very dim, and uh, it, we really had really didn't have a good view of it. And Hubble gave us the best view of Pluto up until 2015. All right. And if anyone knows some space history, some recent space history, there's a spacecraft called New Horizons that flew by Pluto in 2015, gave us up close pictures. Up until then. This was the best view we had of Pluto, and it came from the Hubble Space Telescope. So th this is kind of the observation here, and uh, this is sort of what's modeled after this observation. And so we could see these kind of dark and light patches, but we weren't sure. So it was still pretty blurry, but up until 2015, this was uh, our best images, you know, at least close to this, the best pictures of Pluto because it's so tiny and so dim. Um, but again, New Horizons gave us the best pictures because it was a spacecraft that flew by. You can't beat that. Probably the biggest contribution though to this dwarf planet and under our understanding of it was actually the discovery of its moons by the Hubble Space Telescope. So one of its moons, the first moon we knew about was discovered in 1978 called Charon or Charon. And uh, depends on you know who you, who you ask here. Um, but Hubble was able to discover four more so there's five moons in total, and they're tiny. So if, uh, let's see here, if we give you one other, another picture here, this is a picture that was taken, I believe in 2005, uh, or at least around there. So this is Pluto, okay, from Hubble. This is Charon, the moon that's actually half the size of Pluto, and they orbit around each other, which is a very peculiar system. Uh, but see these two little dots here? That's Nix and Hydra discovered um in 2005 so that was neat and then in 2011 another moon called kerberos was discovered and then in 2012 Styx. so we have nix hydra Styx, kerberos and sharon the five moons that we know about around pluto and so that was a big contribution by hubble of understanding the plutonian system billions of miles away very cool stuff and of course there's so much more that hubble has done understanding helping us understand the solar system. Now let's zoom out from here and we'll fly out to the interstellar realm. So beyond our sun and, or about, beyond our solar system into our neighborhood of stars around the sun. And Hubble has done a tremendous job exploring interstellar space, stars, nebulae, star clusters, even planets beyond our solar system called exoplanets. But what people usually notice with Hubble, or at least seen with, by, you know, from the Hubble Space Telescope, are these beautiful, colorful, gaseous clouds. And there's so many pictures like this from Hubble called nebula or nebulae for multiple of them. And so we have one in particular uh, called the, um, the Orion Nebula that's pretty famous. So what I can do is I can target Orion and I can show you the constellation from space. It's kind of cool. Here's the Orion's belt. And actually near the tip of the sword, there is a nebula that's about 1400 light years away. It's kind of hard to fly to it in this way. Uh, so what I can actually do is I can target um, the actual nebula itself. So let's try that out and see if I can find it here. Here we go. So let's target that hit the right button and fly right to it. And we'll turn off the constellation so it doesn't look too wild here. So about 1400 light years away, there's this big cloud of gas and dust known as the Orion Nebula. 
And here's kind of a 3D model of it. So this is gonna look a little weird. So what I'll start you off with before I make it too confusing here is we'll actually look at uh, the picture of the Orion Nebula from Hubble. That was released in 20, 2006. This is one of the best pictures ever of this. Beautiful. And there are so many examples of pictures like this from the Space Telescope. These gorgeous sort of wispy, colorful clouds um, that, uh, uh, that are filled with stars and actually new stars. This is a star forming region. This is, happens to be the closest star forming region to our planet. And it's still 1400 light years away. The light still takes 1400 years to travel from it to get to us, but that's close for a star forming region. And so it notices just this beautiful complex of uh, gas and dust. There are actually 3000 stars in this. The brightest of, of them are these, there's four in here. If you can look closely in the middle, it's called the trapezium four stars that look like a trapezoid. And those stars are shining brilliantly. They're young, they're luminous. They have a lot of ultraviolet light and stellar wind actually sculpting uh, the gas and eroding the gas away, affecting the area around it. So what I can do is I can zoom in in this 3D model here and show you kind of what this what what that what I mean by that. So this is the picture overlaid onto a model. And notice the kind of cavernous shape you see here. If I kind of turn ourselves and kind of zoom in, you'll see that those stars are actually carving out this cavern that you see here as we fly right into it. Very cool stuff, right? So it looks a little funny, but this kind of gives you an idea, somewhat of an idea of what the nebula is sort of undergoing this erosion process, but then new stars are being born from that process as gas collapses in, into new stars. But most surprising was the discovery in this nebula from Hubble of these little funny little uh, kind of dust clouds around newborn stars. So this is just a series of different ones here. And these are new stars surrounded by a disk of dust and leftover material that material could form into new planets. Maybe these are baby solar systems. And there's a term given to these things. They're called protoplanetary disks. It's kind of a long mouthful to kind of say. So the short term is propylids, protoplanetary disk or propylids, these baby solar systems. So that kind of gives a snapshot of sort of what our solar system may have looked like four and a half plus billion years ago. So Hubble has helped us understand that kind of, of uh, region in space. Amazing stuff there. Okay. Um, and I did mention that uh, Hubble has helped us to understand planets, right? That's possibly new planets. But over time, we've discovered many exoplanets. But uh, many of these planets were actually discovered indirectly either gravitational influence of planets or planets covering up a star and dimming the star. Those are indirect measurements to find planets. Uh, the, possibly the first time ever where a, uh, an exoplanet was discovered directly was from Hubble, and that was of a star called Fomalhaut. And so we can find that picture in our system here. This is pretty neat. So here's the star Fomalhaut. Uh, that's uh, a star in a constellation called Pisces Estrinus, which is the southern fish. You can see it actually in our sky, uh, at least here in Florida. And Fomalhaut means fish's mouth. Um, and it's pretty close, actually, about 25 light years away. So the light takes about 25 years to travel from this to get to us. So here's the star. And this is kind of a dust, dust around the star here. But uh, Hubble was able to observe this. And notice this little thing right here is really tiny. So this is a zoom in here. And it was observed over a couple of years, 2004 and 2006. Notice it moved. And that led astronomers to believe that that is a planet going around this star. So that's pretty amazing. And a direct measurement of a star, it's called Fomalhaut B. Exoplanets are named after their stars with a lowercase letter starting with the letter B. And then you go, if you have more than one, you go B, C, D, E, F, and so on and so on through the alphabet. So Fomalhaut B, and uh, that's pretty neat to discover this little, just little tiny little movement there um, from the Hubble Space Telescope. So that was a pretty big deal. So I love showing that. All right, and then of course there are places where stars have died or are currently dying. 
And one of the most famous is in a constellation called Taurus, which actually happens to be not far away from Orion. Orion the Hunter is here. Taurus is right next to it. So, of course, we can zoom into Taurus here. And actually, in the horns of Taurus, there is a giant leftover, uh, or what we call a remnant of a supernova explosion. So let's see if I can find this supernova explosion. It's called the Crab Nebula, and it's, it, it's the leftover remains of a star that exploded. Really big stars do this. Not our sun. It's not big enough, but really big stars do this can explode in these supernova explosions, releasing heavy elements into space. It's amazing. And so that's how we get heavy elements from our body. If you ever heard the term star, we are star stuff. We, uh, at least the chemical makeup of our body, uh, those, a lot of those elements are what are considered heavy elements, heavier than hydrogen and helium. And they could only have come from these types of, of explosions that seeded the universe with the right elements to form new stars, planets, and maybe life. So Hubble has given us a great picture of this. This is 6,500 light years away. It was seen by the Chinese in 1054 AD. Uh, and so it was actually noticed as this bright thing in the sky in the horns of Taurus the bull. And what's also been observed in the center of this is a spinning neutron star called a pulsar. This is a picture from Hubble and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, another space observatory that studies uh, X-ray light. With the combination of Chandra and Hubble, it gave us this pulsar, this spinning neutron star. And there's these rings, these sort of wisps around it that are actually traveling away from this at half the speed of light. And the pulsar is spinning. It's the leftover, basically dense core of, this, of the star that's so massive, but really small. It's the mass of our sun shrunken down to the size of a city like Manhattan in New York. So imagine that, uh, all that mass, that small, super dense of neutrons, and it happens to be spinning. Actually, I can possibly um, show you a, a, uh, a pulsar in here. It's gonna look a little crazy at first, but here it is. So they spin and they can shoot these jets of, uh, of uh, light and energy out in either direction, almost like a lighthouse. And if we're in the right place, the this the spin can kind of go by us and it will look like a light going on and off really quickly some are fast some are slower the one inside the crab nebula is spinning 30 times per second it's unbelievable stuff if i zoom into this it's going to look a little chaotic here so sorry for the chaos well we can um, pause time if we want to here so it's not so ridiculous you see the magnetic field lines here that are very powerful pulsars or neutron stars have extremely powerful magnetic fields and that contributes to these beams that shoot out from it and so it's very very dense um, and so that's inside the crab nebula studied by the hubble space telescope amazing stuff so that's the kind of cool exotic things that uh, hubble has helped us understand in interstellar space many examples like that now of course we could talk about deep space away from uh, our neighborhood of stars and even away from our own galaxy. So we'll zoom out and Hubble uh, has helped us understand the grandness of our universe, uh, the size, the age, and what is happening to our universe as a whole right now. And that kind of gets us to why it's called the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble is named after Edwin Hubble, this very famous American astronomer in the early 20th century who discovered that the universe is bigger than we ever thought. For the longest time, we thought the universe was this, our Milky Way galaxy, which is already really big. This has billions of stars in it. But he was noticed these certain type of stars uh, called Cepheid variables, these stars that pulsate, they get bright and dim, and they're, they, they're very um, um, predictable. So you can use them as uh, in what are called standard candles. If you know how one Cepheid variable works, you can compare it to another. And if you know what another looks like, and if it's maybe dimmer or brighter, I can tell you how far away that, that, that place is. So he, Edwin Hubble saw a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda galaxy. Notice that Andromeda is much farther away than we realized outside of our galaxy, opened up our eyes to the size of the universe and Hubble has actually been able to look at Cepheid variables just like Edwin Hubble did 
uh, back in the 1920s, actually. So I can show you the Cepheid variable that Hu Edwin Hubble looked at and then the Hubble Space Telescope also looked at as well. Uh, and so here's the Andromeda Galaxy, gorgeous picture here. And there's a star that you can't really see here. So here's a uh, inset here that's zoomed in. So here is this star over a certain amount of days in this 2010 and then into 2011. And uh, it looks like it's brightening in this. And so these Cepheid variables has helped us to understand something called the Hubble constant, um, which uh, can tell us the age uh, of the universe and also that the universe is expanding actually that's what Edwin Hubble helped us understand the universe is growing and getting bigger but this Hubble constant can help us understand the age of the universe and up until the Hubble Space Telescope was launched we thought the universe's age was 10 to 20 billion years old we now have refined it uh, partly because of the Hubble Space Telescope down to 13.8 billion years or so around there in the age of our universe. So this space telescope has helped us to understand how old our entire universe is. That's pretty mind blowing. Uh, and so that's been a major, major uh, discovery and contribution to what's called cosmology. And not only that, the universe is expanding, but also it's accelerating in, in its expansion. And so in 1998, the Hubble Space Telescope was used to look at what are called type 1a supernova or supernovae for multiple supernova so what i can do is i can show you uh one of these um that's pretty famous and so let's see if i can find the right picture here to show you this uh, type 1 supernova here here's the galaxy and this galaxy is pretty far away from us uh but notice there's a little very bright light right here that is a supernova, a type of supernova where one star is close to another and it's pulling material away from that star, getting to a certain mass and then erupting and uh, basically uh, exploding. And it's very predictable. It's also a standard candle like the Cepheid variables. So you can use them as distance measuring tools in space. And uh, a couple teams used Hubble to study these things and notice the universe was accelerating in its expansion. Actually, a, a Nobel Prize was awarded in 2011 because of that discovery. And so the universe is getting bigger, and we think it's because of something called dark energy that's pushing the universe out. It's this repelling force, and it makes up like 90% of the universe is made up of dark energy that we can't really measure. We can't detect it in conventional ways. So we don't really know what it is. Um, but uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has just opened up our eyes to the possibility of this repelling force accelerating the expansion of our universe. So that's pretty amazing. So that is uh, one aspect of what Hubble's done in deep space. And one more image I'll mention that I mentioned in my article was uh, this amazing picture of galaxies. So this is a view of uh, galaxies around our galaxy. Every dot is a separate galaxy. One of the most important pictures ever produced by the Space Telescope is something called the Ultra Deep Field. So these are, uh, this is a picture of, of one tiny little area of the sky taken over many days, all right? And so Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope was used um, to do this actually in multiple times. They, they did this in the 90s in the North and Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then they revisited in the early 2000s with the, with the ultra deep field, looking at these tiny little dark areas of the sky, really small and really dark, observing them for days at a time, 10 plus days. And uh, I think the uh, Hubble ultra deep field is 11 days. And what was revealed are uh, numerous galaxies in the view. I mean, just tons of galaxies. All of those are galaxies. And it just shows you the enormity of our universe and how much is out there. All those are galaxies and it. It helped us to look farther back than we'd ever done before. The deeper in space you look, the further back in time you're seeing. So this picture helps us look back, uh, back to 800 years, 800 million years after the Big Bang, if you can believe that. So that's pretty extraordinary right there. Uh, and some of these galaxies in that picture are some of the oldest we'd ever had seen, at least at the time. And so see these real red 
Cool dot. Those are galaxies formed not long after the Big Bang, and they're very irregular shaped. So they helped us to to see that early or young galaxies look kind of funny shaped. They just haven't had enough time to really get organized. So that's pretty amazing too. So we've really understand the grand scale of the universe because of the Hubble Space Telescope. So one last thing I'll mention before we end this uh, is uh, we're going to zoom back in. A lot of people are asking what is a what's happening with Hubble? What's um, what's going to happen to it? So what we can fly to? We'll just uh, jump. We'll target Earth here. So Hubble's still operating. It could operate well into the 2020s. We'll see if the instruments and the gyroscopes and the computers can maintain uh, over time without any more servicing missions. It eventually could enter Earth's atmosphere or be deorbited and fall into a safe place on Earth uh, as it burns up. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, but for now, it's still being used. It's still observing the universe. So one successor possibly uh, uh, to the Hubble Space Telescope is something called the James Webb Space Telescope. It hasn't launched yet. This is from NASA. It was supposed to launch in 2018, uh, but there's been delays because it's a very complicated mission with uh, basically the, um, the mirrors and the, uh, the shield here. They have to be folded up beforehand as it, launch, as it launches and, um, and then unfold in space. This space telescope is 21 feet in, uh, in diameter here. So Hubble is 7.8 feet, imagine 21 feet. And this is an infrared scope. So this will help us to understand more of the heat signature of the universe. That's why there's a big sun shield here to protect from the sun's heat and infrared light. And so this could look even deeper into the universe, look at the, um, the atmospheres of exoplanets, uh, help us understand star forming regions. Everything we talked about can be studied with the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, very exciting, possibly launching next year. We'll see, um, but that's possibly the, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. So over the years, this instrument has done so much for us and it, will, it continues to with 15,000 uh, scientific papers published and hundreds of thousands of observations done uh, and amazing pictures and uh, and data that has given us an, an understanding of our universe like never before so this 30th anniversary is worth celebrating and here's to many more years for Hubble and and uh, and many more observatories out in space and on the ground so anyway hope you enjoy this kind of longer session uh, about the space telescope hopefully you enjoy this sort of flight through the universe but uh, thanks for checking us out, and uh, hopefully you can uh, maybe take a look at some Hubble images uh, after this uh, to celebrate uh, what uh, we can see in the universe. So take care. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, hopefully you'll check us out for more great content from the Museum of Arts and Sciences.